Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar, Getting Started in Live Sound, presented by Pete Alcock. My name is Laura Lawrence, and I'm the Global Marketing Director at Harman. So just a few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during the webinar. However, there is a chat function where you can submit questions to the presenter, and he'll try to answer as many questions as possible at the end. This webinar is being recorded, and the link will be made available a few days after this presentation. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control, and we'd like to encourage you to take a look at the different webinars in our learning session workshop series on pro.harman.com, as well as visiting Harman Professional University to see our many on-demand and certification courses that are all available to you for free. And now I'd like to introduce you to Pete Elcock, the presenter for today's webinar. Based in Bournemouth, UK, Pete is a veteran sound engineer who trained with BBC Radio in the 80s. In recent, recent years, Pete has focused on live sound, recording and mixing for some of the UK's foremost jazz musicians, such as Nigel Price, Jason Ribello, Derek Nash, and Chris Rand. Now I'm going to pass it over to you, Pete. Thank you very much, Laura, for that kind introduction. Hi, everybody, and welcome to this session on the UI24R. Um, I expect to be talking for about 40 to 50 minutes, and uh, I'll be very pleased to take any questions that you may have. Um, at the end. This webinar is aimed at anyone thinking about buying um, a Soundcraft UI digital mixer or anyone that's already got one and is perhaps looking for um, another engineer's perspective on how best to use it. This training is intended as an introduction to doing live sound on the UI, so I won't be covering the more complex capabilities of the unit such as uh, automatic mixing, uh, virtual sound checks, matrices and so on. Once you start to need the advanced features that the UI has, uh, there's plenty of good online resources on the Soundcraft website that serves your country. Um, just, ah, good. Um, so this is what's coming up. Hey, Pete, uh, I'm sorry. I'm just going to interrupt you real quick. There's a pop-up window that's blocking the middle of your screen. If you could just drag that off. All right. So I think that was a question that popped in, actually. Yep, that's okay. Thank you. Sorry. Do I close those? If you just drag it off the screen, that should prevent more from popping up. So what you did was perfect. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so this is uh, this is what's coming up. Um, I'll give you some background on how, how I became to uh, use the UI at the heart of my PA system. And as part of that, I'll explain the benefits of using the UI um, for portable small-scale um, live sound reinforcement. I'll show, <clears throat> show you how I've got my UI set up at an average gig, and I'll explain how I've come to the present configuration. Um, I'll also explain what I'm planning to do next with it. Then we'll get into the weeds of the actual interface. <clears throat> There's a lot of really useful functionality um, in the user interface of the UI that isn't immediately obvious, so I'll explain how to see and how to use all of those. Um, next, I'll share some tips on how to have a clean and uncluttered layout on your screen when you're controlling the UI. Um, as we know, live mixing can be a high-pressure situation. Uh, we've all experienced this when things aren't going perhaps as well as we'd hoped, and all eyes are on the sound guy. Um, so lastly, if there's uh, questions that come in, um, I'll do my best to, uh, to answer them. So, how did I get into live sound? I promise I won't uh, get boring about this. Um, in the 70s, I got into uh, electronics and music, and I built discos and flashing lights and whatnot. And after getting thrown out of university, uh, where I was supposed to be studying electronics, I actually spent more time working with the bands that were touring through the college um, at the time. I applied to join the BBC as an engineer. This was in London. Um, they accepted me, and this gave me a decent grounding in most things audio, and we got to do some pretty cool things like spend hours playing in the studios at Maida Vale, and that's the BBC's recording studios um, in London, um, on the SSL 4000 series consoles. Um, the bands that used to come in to do sessions would leave their two-inch multi-track tapes on the, uh, the Studer A800s, and we'd lace them up, and we'd do our own mixes of uh, Echo and the Bunny Men and uh, uh, all sorts of bands from that era. So um, after this, our daughters um, started singing at school, and I volunteered my services to help with uh, the technical stuff. 
and uh, I didn't need much of an excuse to start buying equipment, do we ever? Um, I started with a little Soundcraft mixer and I built some speakers and soon I began to be known in the schools locally um, as the dad who was a sound guy. You know, in around uh, 2007, one of my girls um, started singing with a local big band, a swing band, and um, uh, it wasn't long before they found out that I did sound and I was recruited as their technical manager. I've worked with Swing Unlimited Big Band ever since, and we do about uh, 20 or so gigs a year, which is a lot of fun, and they're also great musicians. And we've recorded about um, seven um, albums, seven CDs so far, and I've produced and mixed a couple of those. Um, in 2012, one of the band's musical directors um, decided to start a jazz club uh, with the hope of persuading some of the famous jazz musicians from London to broaden their fan base um, to come down to Bournemouth and, um, you know, play to an expectant and appreciative jazz audience in Bournemouth. Um, what took off was um, a very well attended jazz club and it was run on a weekly basis. Uh, we got through, I think, six venues. We're on our sixth venue at the moment. And uh, it took place every week uh, right up until the beginning of this year. Uh, we were forced to have a break because of licensing in one of the venues and then um, coronavirus hit. So it's all been on hold since then. <clears throat> um, in uh, 2014, I was doing a pub gig. Um, I don't just do jazz, but there's a few function bands that I work with as well. A small, really crowded place locally. And I was mixing, as you sometimes have to, from the side of the stage, because it would have just been impossible um, to run a multicore around the, the pub because um, it was heaving with people and there wouldn't be anywhere to put the desk even if I had. I was hunched over the desk um, trying to prevent spillage of beer from all the people that were bumping and jostling and I thought wouldn't it be good if there was a way that I could remotely control this mixer if I could sit over the other side of the bar rather than right underneath one of the speaker stacks and um, just do my thing without the need for, um, for wires. Now, this is a weird thing, but a week later, I saw it popped up on one of my uh, feeds um, a video from it might have been NAM or the AES show, one of these um, uh, sound industry trade shows. And there was an Australian guy demonstrating a mixer that was controlled by an iPad wirelessly. And I was absolutely spellbound. I thought this this is a game changer. And uh, this is exactly what I'd envisaged only a little while before. Um, I did some research <clears throat> and found that the Aussie guy was uh, Danny Olesh and um, I immediately pestered him by email, um, must have written him half a dozen emails over, this, over the course of a few months, pleading for him to make this thing available in the UK. Um, the trail went cold and I gave up, um, unaware at the time that um, the Umix product, as SM Pro Audio called it, um, had been bought by Soundcraft. Uh, the next thing, late in 2015, um, the UI16 um, launched in the UK. Obviously, I had to have one. And um, I went to our local Soundcraft stock it, Absolute Music in, uh, in Poole, um, a great shop. And um, I got my um, first UI16. Um, I then started the process of getting used to mixing on glass, um, which was completely different from anything that I'd done before and uh, then very tentatively uh, my first jazz club gig um, I rolled out the UI16 and um, things went reasonably well. It wasn't altogether plain sailing but um, a bit more on that later. Um, so here's um, a few shots of the, um, the jazz club in its, uh, its various venues. Um, you can see typically uh, trios, quartets, sextets, that kind of thing. Um, nothing really particularly noisy, nothing that needed uh, a great deal of sound reinforcement, um, but in order to get um, a decent blend, a decent mix for the, the whole of the audience, um, we always used to mic everything and um, put up a decent PA. Um, I mentioned the uh, the big band. <clears throat> Occasionally we, uh, we get outdoors and um, the last couple of years I've been using my uh, UI24 uh, with the, the full big band um, outside. And we had a, 
rather nice PA um, system there that we'd hired in from uh, from Absolute Music, and we made a lot of noise out in the sunshine um, last September. So, to summarise the um, the benefits of the UI, um, I'll look at what I used to do: my simple analog mixer. Um, I had a, a Soundcraft Spirit to start with, then I had a, an FX8, an FX16, and an LX7, um, and a couple of other um, Allen and Heath mixers. I won't mention those. And um, what I found for when I started using them at Jazz Club was that an analog mixer needs outboard. Um, if it's got um, sound effects, you know, reverb and whatnot built in, um, they would be okay, but you could never use more than one at once and uh, you were fairly limited. Um, I also needed um, compressors for vocals and um, you know, perhaps we might gate the drums. And um, So I ended up taking a rack of outboard alongside um, this uh, little mixer. And um, well, the mix position. Um, the choices were either you mix at the side of the stage, uh, which is really ideal, uh, or you have to uncoil the, um, uh, the dreaded snake, run that round the uh, the venue um, just so that you can mix at the back. Monitors, doing monitors from uh, front of house position, um, it's pretty much pure guesswork. Um, you get the bore of this in the this wedge and uh, all that kind of thing. And uh, recording, of course, um, with a, a small low cost analog mixer is pretty much limited to, um, to two track. Um, because the board gets zeroed, you're starting a sound check from scratch every gig. So even if you've got the same band in the following week, um, something's going to get fiddled and tweaked with, so you, you've got to start from, uh, from zero. So the world of the UI24 by uh, comparison. For a start, it's a fraction of the size. Um, I'll show you mine in its flight case in a moment. Um, there's more effects than you could ever need. Um, there's gates, there's EQ, there's compression. Um, on every channel. Um, we've got um, eight auxiliaries, so you can have a um, monitor sends to all the wedges on the stage. It will cope perfectly well with um, uh, in-ears as well. And um, when you're setting monitors, you can just leap up onto uh, the um, uh, leap up onto the stage. And uh, so I'm just seeing a, a record, a note here. All right, so I just moved uh, as a message just uh, popped up. Um, so yeah, setting monitors, leap up onto the stage, stand right by the uh, the lead singer as he's singing, and um, you can set up the monitor mix on your iPad or tablet, um, you know, right uh, where he's listening. And you can save all the settings for the next gig. Um, you can save as many gigs as you like. Um, I've had bands that have come back 18 months, two years later, have dialed up the settings, and whilst it might not be perfect because the venue's changed or we've got different mics or whatever, um, it's a very useful starting point um, for starting the um, starting the gig off and the sound check. The only potential downside is that when you're um, sat by the bar mixing your band, um, you've got no means of um, using your headphones to solo anything, unless you um, use something like a, an in-ear monitor pack or um, you know a radio mic um, type arrangement, or you just run around um, a um, an XLR um, to feed your headphones. But I say, who needs headphones anyway? Um, so, just um, advance this on. Oh, it's gone twice. Right. So, um, connection options for the uh, the UI. Um, you've got your UI, and um, the basic arrangement is that you can um, use the inbuilt Wi-Fi hotspot to connect it directly to um, a tablet iPad or a, <clears throat> I use a, um, an Android, a, um, a Samsung Galaxy 10-inch um, tablet. Now the um, the UI24 has got um, a Wi-Fi hotspot built in. It will work on the um, uh, 2.4 and, and 5 gig um, bands. Um, there's a little aerial on the top, and there's also another aerial on the side. Um, the problem is um, that. When the UI is on the ground at the back of the stage, 
it's usually um, shielded from, uh, it doesn't have direct line of sight um, to you and your um, tablet at the front of the venue. Um, so, um, and there's a, another aerial in the side. Of course, when the thing is in the flight case, um, that also shields the side antenna. So the RF performance is um, compromised um, because of the way that the, the UI is, is typically situated um, at a live gig. So um, what most people recommend, indeed Soundcraft recommend uh, in the manual, is that you use an external uh, router. Um, I use a, a wireless access point. I found a, a cheap TP-Link um, wireless access point. Um, plug a piece of uh, Cat5 cable in the back of the UI into the uh, wireless access point, and you can then mount the wireless access point up high. Um, I'll show you what I did with mine um, a bit later on, but I basically put some hooks on it, and um, that hooks onto the top of the speakers, um, so I've got line of sight even outdoors. I can be right out in the middle of the crowd, and uh, I've still got um, a decent Wi-Fi signal to be able to control the mixer. The only problem using it outdoors is the um, you know the sunshine being able to see the actual uh, screen of the of the um, the tablet. Um, the um, third um, option is to directly plug in um, a mini touchscreen um, by HDMI and USB. HDMI comes out of the uh, UI24. Um, it's limited in resolution to 720 pixels, so it means that you can get um, a, a standard um, control um, appearance as you would on uh, on any tablet. Um, there is an option in the UI24, which we'll take a look at um, shortly, um, which is known as Big D, which is where um, it splits the screen into um, uh, the main faders, and then you can have um, EQ and dynamics in um, in different parts of the screen. Um, but um, the uh, the HDMI um, connection doesn't support that. What I would say, though, and this is one of the most important things I've found. This thing has been an absolute godsend. This is my um, little um, HDMI um, touchscreen monitor. It was cheap as chips from uh, Amazon, I think, and um, it's got a, a glass screen. It's made by Ellie Crow, um, obviously an Asian make, and um, just plugs in um, as a USB um, that goes into the UI. That's obviously for the, um, the touch interface. HDMI goes in the back. The reason that it's so important is that um, occasionally, and it's very occasionally, um, you have problems with uh, Wi-Fi. Um, if you go into an average function suite in a hotel, uh, there will probably be 10 wireless hotspot, wireless hotspot um, points all vying for, um, for your attention. Um, there will be users with their um, personal Wi-Fi hotspots. Uh, when you get an audience in, um, it becomes a very congested um, RF spectrum indeed. And it's just possible, it's happened to me once or twice, that um, the tablet even with my uh, wireless access point high up, um, I, I lose control of the UI. Um, now, you, you can go into the UI and you can change the RF channels. <clears throat> the problem is that if you've already lost control, um, you've lost connection between the UI and the tablet, um, you, you're really not in a good place to be able to regain control. Um, so what I found with this little external HDMI monitor is that if you're Ethernet has all gone wrong, if your Wi-Fi has gone to worms, if the internal hotspot is being interfered with, you plug in this um, HDMI, and even though you've got to sit within three feet of the uh, the UI itself, at least you've got control over what's going on. And um, whilst you necessarily want to mix a band um, sat right underneath the speakers on an HDMI-connected um, uh, mini touchscreen, um, it's better than not being able to control anything at all. So that's my um, first um, top tip. Um, you get a UI24, strongly suggest that you get one of these mini touchscreens. Um, I just leave it by the side of the UI. It's useful when I'm setting up and um, naming channels and, um, you know, before the sound check starts. Um, but it's also there as a, as a complete fail-safe backup if I, if I lose connectivity. Um, so 
This is the um, uh, fourth connection option. You can use an external PC and um, a touchscreen. This is what I'd, I'd rather like to uh, to do next. Actually, I'm um, planning on um, getting a maybe a 24-inch monitor, put it in a Pelly case um, with a little mini PC, and um, you know the whole thing just run out um, a robust um, Cat5 cable. I know it's running out of cable where we said that one of the benefits wasn't to need a cable um, to, to connect um, to the uh, the UI, but running out of Cat5 is a, is a heck of a lot less hassle than running out um, a 24 plus um, for uh, multi-core. So I don't know if you can see um, the image on the screen uh, clearly enough, but that, that's a, an illustration of the Big D um, interface. The fader's at the bottom, and then you can choose what appears in the top part of the screen, but it gives you, um, you click on, a con on one of the faders, and it will instantly show the EQ curve and the dynamic settings um, that you've got for that particular channel. It's really cool. And um, lastly, you can have the whole lot. <coughs> um, so you can have um, a tablet connected um, directly to the internal hotspot. You can have a tablet connected um, via a wireless access point. Um, you probably would need um, that to be um, a router in order that it can share the, um, the CAT5, the Ethernet connection, uh, with a mini PC. Um, so um, I'm showing a wireless access point, but it could just as easily be a wireless router, in which case um, your mini PC will be fed from a Cat5 um, from there. Mini touch screen, and um, that just goes directly into the UI. So um, yeah, that's that's how you connect things up, and that's how you gain control of the uh, the mixer. So this is the UI. Um, <coughs> obviously, these are the uh, the input XLRs. The top rows are um, combo XLRs, so they've got the uh, the jack. So you can plug things like keyboards and uh, guitars and so forth in directly. Um, I tend to use um, DI boxes um, just because it keeps everything balanced and uh, I don't have really any very long jack leads. Um, the first two um, inputs are uh, switchable high impedance. So if you've got um, uh, guitar pickups that uh, need a very high impedance uh, input, you can plug into those. And there is um, Digitech amp modeling built in. We'll take a look at that in a second as well. So that if you fancy um, playing through um, a Mesa Boogie and you can only afford a, um, a cheap guitar amp, then you can go in there and it will make you sound like you're playing through a Mesa Boogie. That's what they say. Um, the two phonos are for uh, line inputs. Um, so if you've got um, a laptop or uh, something that you need to play music in from, that can go in there. And the two USB sockets on the front panel, one is um, for play, so you can have your uh, walk-in music and your break music, um, your playlist on a, a USB stick, pop that in there, and the lower one is for recording. But we'll talk a bit more about uh, recording um, using the UI a bit later on, but um, that's where your high-speed um, USB 3 uh, memory stick will have to go if you want to do multi-track recording. Um, the lower uh, USB, I think that's a Type B uh, USB connector. That's if you want to use the, U, uh, the UI as a recording interface. You can plug it directly into uh, PC uh, running digital audio workstation software. Um, the knobs on the top, um, the phones, which controls the volume, I think, are just the uh, the first headphone jack. The other one is uh, in software, and mix left and right. Um, these are the uh, the main outputs from the mixer. So uh, when you're getting everything plugged in, you can turn those down, and you won't send any pops or bangs into the uh, the PA until you're ready. And it allows you to optimize your gain structure um, between the output of the UI, which is um, outputting a nominal um, professional line level when it's at the two o'clock position. You can just about see there is a, um, a little ident there for um, the normal, and um, then you'd set your power amps for uh, to give you the uh, the level that you want in the room. Um, the main outs are available on XLR and jacks, and there's a little light that flashes uh, when you're outputting signals, so you know. If they're flashing and there's nothing coming out of the PA, then you know that it's not the fault of the UI and you need to look um, further downstream. Um, the eight XLRs are the auxiliary outputs. 
Um, they have this AFS2, the Advanced Feedback Suppression. Um, to be honest, I've never really found that I've needed it in most of the venues um, because I'm not doing um, screaming rock music with um, 120 decibel monitor wedges. Um, you know, my jazz gigs tend to be a bit more uh, sedate and serene than that. So um, AFS is there and it will put notches into the, uh, the spectrum of your microphones uh, where the feedback is going to occur. Aerial on the top, another one on the side, and um, when that little light comes on, you know that the hotspot is active. Um, so uh, we'll now get um, into the um, the actual interface of the UI. Um, I'll take you through some of the screens and what they do. Um, we'll look at setting gain, the uh, the options on the channel. Uh, we'll look at EQ, um, dynamics, and so forth. Um, views and mutes. Views allow you to um, change what you see um, on the screen um, in terms of the, the channels that are displayed. And uh, I've always found that's a good idea. If you've got um, a big band, it's going to involve an awful lot of scrolling back and forth through those um, 20 channels, bearing in mind that on a tablet you can typically see um, you know, between eight and a dozen channels at, uh, at once. Um, you'll be scrolling back and forth a fair bit. So um, by using um, groups and VCAs and so forth, we can um, condense that down and make it more usable. Um, sorting out monitor mixes, um, we'll a quick look at the setup section and the uh, the Big D interface, and then um, have a look at recording. So I'm just going to um, uh, click over to uh, my UI. Um, hopefully you can see that now. So um, I've got um, an Ethernet connection between my uh, router, which is um, feeding to the internet, and um, uh, my UI, which is um, in another room at the moment because there's a fan in the flight case and it's a bit too uh, bit too noisy. So um, <clears throat> the basic interface is, as you see, um, you've got the um, the channels, and we can have mono channels, and we can gang. Um, channels together to make them stereo, and um, we can uh, label each of the channels um, by pressing and holding um, on the um, the scribble strip at the bottom. So rename simply uh, allows you to put in um, a different name for the channel. Uh, we can uh, color code them so that you can make all your drums red, all your saxophones green, whatever uh, whatever takes your fancy. Um, and um, this is where we um, uh, enable and disable stereo link. So there is my um, keyboard channel left and right. Um, if I disable the stereo link, um, they move independently and um, uh, that would um, allow them to be uh, moved together. Um, this is where um, I can assign subgroups and VCAs. Um, might as well explain um, the difference between these two now. Um, these, they're both ways of grouping channels together. Um, VCA subgroups are where you um, assign um, a group of uh, a bunch of channels together. Let's say um, the drums, put all the drums together and on uh, VCA1, and that VCA Fader then acts as a, a remote control, if you will, um, for all of the um, faders that are in that VCA group. So that's a useful thing to do. Once you've got the um, the drums sounding good, um, tend not to want to be um, you know individually changing uh, the, the the balance of the drums as the gig goes on. You can do, but um, it saves a lot of um, uh, real estate on the screen um, if you group all those together. So I can put the, um, all of the, the drums into a, a subgroup and that single VCA fader will allow me to turn them up and down. Um, a subgroup, uh, one of the purple subgroups, um, is also a way of grouping to channels, um, but it's a way of routing all of those channels into one fader. Um, what that allows us to do is to apply processing across all of the channels um, in that group. So if I want to put, um, um, say, group all my saxophones together and then put um, uh, a compressor or a limiter over the saxes so that when somebody um, stands up, 
risks of you know, hitting the M stops and uh, taking people's heads off, um, the limiter will, uh, will, will bring down um, all of the saxes uh, in the group. I tend to use um, VCAs more than um, subgroups because I don't find I have the need to, uh, to apply um, processing across um, a range of channels. Um, so um, the last thing in here is um, channel presets. Um, this is quite cool. Um, there is a, a bunch of um, preset EQs for just about anything that um, uh, you could need. So if I um, dial up a, um, a snare drum, I'll load that in. Um, no, I forgot which channel I uh, did that on. Let's just try. Uh, Yep, that's my um, snare drum. So what was the keyboard channel? I've now applied um, a preset um, snare drum EQ to it. So that's the starting point for um, uh, the UI's preset um, for um, snare drum. I'll just go back to, uh, to the mix screen. Um, the navigation along the top um, is uh, mix gain, um, shows me this mix screen. If I press it again, um, it shows all of the, um, uh, the the fader tracks in red, and this is the uh, gain. This is where we're setting the head amp gain um, in the UI. Um, in analog terms, it's the input gain on the, the very top of the channel. Um, but instead of being on a channel-by-channel -channel basis, uh, we can see the, um, the input gain um, of all the channels that we've got connected. At the um, top of the channel, um, it shows the, um, the gain that is actually applied um, in the head amp. So we move this up and down, and we can um, see the, uh, the little display at the top um, will change. This is where we apply um, 48 volt phantom power. So if I um, press that on, you see there's a little uh, yellow flash um, appears. It's, um, the UI is kind to speakers in that if you apply phantom power with a channel turned on, it will instantly mute um, that channel for maybe five or 10 seconds or so, whilst the um, 48 volts DC stabilizes and whatever you're feeding, um, you know, gets switched, it's condenser mic or a DI box or whatever, um, it will sort itself out and there'll be no nasty noises. See the little flash has come on again whilst everything's settling down. The first two channels have this um, high Z. That's the high impedance um, setting um, for um, guitar pickups. And uh, the uh, button next to that is delay. So the UI allows us to um, apply an input delay um, to every channel um, individually. Not something that you always need, but if you're on a particularly deep stage, um, it's possible that um, you know the, the snare drum, which is a kind of penetrating sort of sound instrument, um, is going to be maybe 10 foot or more um, behind the, um, the PA stacks. And on the rule of thumb that um, sound travels at one, uh, millis, one millisecond per foot, one foot per millisecond, um, 10 feet, 10 milliseconds, that's 100 per, per second, um, it's going to tighten up the sounds of drums and so forth if you can correct um, by applying um, a delay. So you're basically delaying the sound that's coming out of the PA um, by the time that it takes for the sound to travel from the instrument itself um, to where the loudspeakers are. Um, so that's the, uh, the gain set, uh, delay, all oh, the last, uh, the polarity, the, the polarity or used to be referred to as phase, people always get uh, uh, incensed if you call it phase, it's more correctly a, a polarity button, so um, if you need that for any reason, if you're double miking kick drums or double miking snares, then you can um, you can change the polarity on one of the mics to make it all uh, work properly. Um, so we'll just um, flip back to uh, the, uh, the main mix screen. Now, um, the actual meters, this is one, one of the really neat things about the, um, the UI is that this interface shows you so much in, information about uh, what's going on. Um, I've got uh, some music playing into um, channel 9 and 10 uh, from an iPad which is, which is outside. And you can see that this channel 9 is faded down, but it's showing up blue. That is the pre-fader 
um, signal level. So that is monitoring what is um, after the head amp uh, and before the fader in sort of signal flow analog sort of terms. When I uh, turn up that channel, um, you'll see the actual signal level um, post fader um, starting to show up in yellow. And obviously when I get to unity gain, which is about there, um, the green is right over the top of the blue, so you don't see the blue anymore. Um, that's also visible in the meters view, which is this button at the, uh, the top corner. So you can just see um, a, a faint witness behind. That's the, um, uh, the pre-fade um, signal level. And what's bobbling up and up, up and down in the green, and it will um, go yellow and then eventually red, um, is the post-fade signal level. So we can see what's going on across all of our um, 20 channels and um, four virtual channels. Um, there's, these are the, um, the auxiliaries, so we're obviously sending um, channels 8 and 9 um, to auxiliaries 1 and 2, our monitors. If I double click on this, it takes me back to um, the main mix screen. There's a lot of these um, double click or hold and press um, options that are um, built into the, uh, the user interface. If I double click um, on the fader cap, I get the EQ screen. Double click in the EQ, it takes me back to uh, the, uh, the mix screen again. Um, if I uh, double click in the uh, fader label um, at the bottom, it takes me straight away to the dynamics and double click the dy dynamics and I'm, I'm back in the room um, for mixing. Any of the, um, the buttons um, in the UI that have um, uh, have a little um, spot in the corner uh, where a press and hold is available. So um, if I press and hold um, view groups, for instance, that opens up this window where I can set um, view groups. And I said that I was going to talk about um, view, group, view groups because that's a, a particularly good way of, um, of tidying up the interface. So. Uh, for this show, this was um, the producers. This was a, a band that played at the jazz club in January, and um, fairly straightforward uh, four-piece blues band. Um, kit overhead, overhead um, keys. He's played a lot of Hammond organ, um, bass, um, Harry's guitars. Uh, the Ridgeville was uh, an acoustic guitar which we didn't end up using, and there was a support band who was just um, Martin, a guy playing the guitar, and um, uh, he was singing. So what I did was set up some uh, some view groups so that when I hit um, view group one, this was for the support band. So uh, there was Martin's guitar, Martin's um, vocals. I kept the, uh, the main on stage vocal um, visible as well, just in case any announcements needed to be made. And um, I also kept uh, visible um, an audience mic um, because we were recording um, the session as well. And the player um, is the um, uh, player from the uh, the USB stick, which I had um, in the top of the UI, and that was for the um, the, the walking music and uh, the music in the breaks we were changing over. Um, I also um, brought up into this view um, the first effects return, so that um, I had control over um, how wet or dry um, the effects were um, on Martin's voice. Now, if I look at um, view number two, this is what I set up um, for the main band. Now, you see that um, Martin and uh, Martin's guitar have, have now vanished, and I've just got the, um, the whole of the, the main band. You can start to see the problem, though, that we're, um, we're needing to scroll in order to um, see all of the channels. So what I did was set um, a third view, uh, which has got all the drums um, into a VCA. So normally the VCA sits at, um, at Unity Game. I can turn down all of the drums if I want to, but um, it, it's just there really as a means of grouping them all together. And you'll see that there's a spill button in the, um, the lower um, corner of that VCA channel. When I hit the spill, it opens up that VCA group and allows me to see all of the uh, the drum channels, and I can then make adjustments to the uh, the toms or the hi-hat or, or whatever it is that I need to. When I've done that, 
close it down, and I'm back uh, with a nice compact layout um, on my iPad. Um, so that's the uh, the views and the mute and the mutes, um, BCAs and subgroups. Now monitor mixes. Um, I'll just go back to the um, uh, the main view uh, for a second. There's two ways that um, you can control the auxiliary sends on the UI. Um, you can either do it if you're already used to using digital mixers, you'll be familiar with the term sends on faders. And when you hit um, auxiliary sends, um, it does exactly that. So these are our different uh, monitor mixes, um, auxiliary four. And I can set um, the amount of each of the channels that appears in um, auxiliary four um, on the screen. I can scroll across. And in the same way that I can label the channels, if I press and hold the auxiliary master, I can uh, rename that um, to be, uh, let's say, box wedge. And uh, auxiliary four is now um, the vocal wedge. I'll just go back to the, uh, the main screen. The other way of doing it is um, to go into edit and this brings up a sub menu um, uh, where we can set um, our EQ, our gates, compression, um, the effect sends, and also our um, uh, auxiliary sends. Now, for some reason, that's been um, set as um, a matrix, which we don't really want at the moment. I'll just go to there and that's still in wedge in a matrix. Anyway, um, I won't waste time on that because um, time's moving on. But this um, uh, edit mode, normally you would get your um, auxiliary um, sends appear up here. And it allows you to um, set um, <clears throat> the amount of um, this channel that we're on um, into the, um, the various um, auxiliary sends. Um, right. Next thing is um, the player section. Um, this um, denotes um, media player. We've got um, the two track USB. Um, so this is my playlist. So um, that's playing. It's um, playing my um, my playlist. And um, this is where we also um, control the uh, the recording. So the UI, um, one of the, the most incredible features really is the ability to do um, 22 channel direct multi-track recording live um, to a, US a USB memory stick. You need a fast memory stick. Um, I use a, um, a Samsung 32 gig USB three memory stick and, and it really has to be um, a guaranteed fast one if you want to uh, to do lots of, of channels at once. Um, you can set the format that you record into, uh, WAV24, WAV16 or the FLAC. You can select all of the channels, but the better bet really is to select only the, um, clear all, select the, the channels that we actually want to record. Now this producer's gig that took place in January, I recorded and uh, subsequently went on to produce um, a CD. Um, obviously we don't want Martin um, because he was the support act and uh, we don't need um, the Pat's radio mic. He was the, um, the compare on the evening. So uh, we don't necessarily need that recorded. And so set up some channels. And uh, when I go back to um, the, uh, Oh, beg your pardon. When I go to this and hit record, that's now recording um, all of those um, channels um, into the memory stick. Um, it shows how much space is remaining on the memory stick, and this little uh, indicator is um, uh, shows how uh, the buffer um, is filling up. That's the uh, the data that's getting written to the USB stick. Um, if it goes yellow, it means that Things are struggling. If it goes red, then you're going to end up with uh, with errors in the recording. But um, I've never seen it go any further than uh, you know about a third of the way across. 
Um, right, so that little indicator in the top shows that um, um, it's recording in multi-track. Uh, the next thing I need to show you quickly is into the, um, the settings. Now, there's a whole host of settings. To be honest, most of these you just have to, uh, to get in and um, see what they do. Uh, the manual is really good, but um, there's a couple that are, uh, are worthy of, of me picking up on here. Um, big desktop mode. Um, now, as I said, this is only available um, if you're using um, a touchscreen monitor um, connected to an external PC. Um, the UI needs to uh, reload the interface in order to, uh, to load Big D. It takes a few seconds. And this is what we're um, treated to. So we've now got um, the faders at the bottom, and we've got the option of the, uh, the gain um, for each channel on the top. But over here, we can check uh, dynamics and EQ. So if I say um, hit my base channel, that's the base EQ. and um, that is the um, dynamic setting that I've got for that particular channel. I hit floor tom, that's my floor tom EQ, and um, there's no dynamic set for the floor tom. <clears throat> I can also um, change that to be sends. So for any selected channel, it shows uh, the monitor sends and the effect sends, and um, the info channel is, um, you need a um, good glasses and a very high resolution screen, but that will show um, a graphical indication of um, uh, the um, level of uh, the auxiliary sends and so forth for that channel. So if you're prepared to run out a Cat5 and have a PC and a, a large touch screen, this really is the uh, the optimal way um, of using the, um, the UI. Um, the Big D interface is um, something that um, none of the previous UIs had, the UI 12 and UI 16. It's only available in the, uh, the UI 24, um, but um, it's really cool. Right, um, I'm sort of uh, getting tight on time, so <clears throat> there's just a couple of things um, that I wanted to uh, show you. Uh, where's my presentation? Um, and there we are. Uh, <clears throat> this is um, uh, a couple of um, CDs that I've done with the UI. And this was the producers. That was a session that you saw a moment ago. Recorded it, took the memory stick home, brought it to uh, here to the studio, mixed it, and uh, that's been released by the band. Um, <clears throat> it was supposed to be in uh, May or June time, but they're going to wait until after lockdown. Um, a jazz band, um, Chris Rand's Gathering, That's um, you can listen to that on Spotify. Um, I recorded it on the UI, sent all of the, um, the multi-track stems um, to Chris Rand, um, and he went to a studio in Germany um, to mix that, and uh, that's been released um, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, you, can, you can listen to that on Spotify um, if it's of interest. Um, galloping along, this is my UI. Um, this is the flight case that I've um, got it um, all stuffed into. I had it custom made by a local um, flight case company. Um, it's got a separate lid. Um, in the lid um, is a, a little latch, and it's padded, and it's got some carpet. That's where I keep my um, wireless access point and the cables, the uh, the mains cable and uh, the Cat5 cable and so forth for the, uh, the access point. Um, let's take um, a closer look. This is the wireless access point. It was um, <clears throat> a TP-Link um, access point, cracked open the plastic case and put it inside a metal box, a die-cast, um, what we call an eddy box. Um, that means that it's um, it's gig robust and it's gig ready. It's got um, uh, nutrient connectors in the bottom for the Ethernet and um, for the power. And I put the power supply for the wireless access point inside the flight case uh, with the UI. So Ethernet and wireless access point power. And USB and HDMI on the top panel as well. Um, that's for my um, you know special emergency use um, HDMI touchscreen. Um, you can see that at the bottom. These are my line source speakers. These are um, Italian made with um, 
uh, six or eight woofers and some horns, and they stand about um, uh, eight foot tall when the whole lot's uh, rigged. Um, so that gets the, the wireless access point up nice and high. Um, my preferred setup process, I get there first, I try and uh, load in the PA, uh, meet the venue manager and, and see where we're playing. And try and get the um, the speakers, the power distro. I always bring my own um, power distribution because I know that it's going to work. I know that it's safe. Put the uh, the wedges on the stage. Obviously, leave room for the band to get in with uh, with drum kits and amps and whatnot. Set up the UI. Um, scan for uh, Wi-Fi. You can do that with an Android tablet. You can't do it with uh, unfortunately with an iPad. And um, fire up the PA. Put the um, sound check music from the USB, walk the room, make sure that um, we've got no booms or uh, dead spots in the coverage. <clears throat> then get on, set up the uh, the mics. I always call the band in advance so that I know what uh, instruments they're bringing, so I know how many of what kinds of mics and how many DIs and whatnot they want. Um, do a line check and get um, a decent level um, in the vocal wedge, hopefully all before the band turn up. When the band come, they're going to be nervous. If they get the impression that everything is ready for them, um, the lead singer will go up to the vocal mic and the monitors are working. It all helps to ease them into the gig, helps build confidence, build rapport, and, um, and you're going to have a nice time. A um, couple of things. Uh, I mentioned about um, uh, the big band <clears throat> and a big band is typically um, 17 musicians. I was determined to make it work with the UI24. There was no way I could make uh, do a big gig with the UI16. Um, but um, with 17 musicians, obviously you're soon going to run out of channels. Um, so I've found a couple of uh, dodges that allow me to fit a whole big band into the um, the UI24. Um, so I do a fairly minimal set over the drums, um, kick, a couple of overheads and the toms, um, bass keyboards. The saxes, because the saxophones are instruments that um, stand up to do a solo, it's nice to have individual control of the saxes, so they all get their own channel. Um, radio mic, we have a crazy compare, um, Pat, who started the uh, the jazz club, he always runs around with, uh, with a radio mic. Um, main singer's mic and uh, our keyboard player sings too. What I found though is that um, in a big band, the trombones are usually all playing together apart from where they're doing solos. So <clears throat> you can Y together. I know this isn't um, uh, a purist approach, but you can literally parallel, make a Y chord with a couple of XLRs, parallel two trombones. So um, it means that you can fit four trombones into two channels. Do the same with the uh, the trumpets. I tend to use SM57s for the trumpets with a um, uh, Perspex disc so they can hear themselves a bit more, and uh, clip-on condenser mics for the trombones. Clip-on condensers, again, people say, oh, no, you can't use two of those in one channel. You can, and um, it works like a charm. And lastly, um, I use channels 21 and 22. These are the phono line-ins um, for um, keyboard in stereo. Sure, it's not balanced, but um, usually, um, you don't tend to pick up too much harm and background noise from the keyboard um, because it's line level anyway. And um, I've got um, a little gadget that allows me to do that, which is here. Um, it's my um, keyboard splitter. So two jacks wired into um, um, an XLR. So the screen on uh, one, <clears throat> jack one on two, jack two um, on three. And then the keyboard combiner, which is um, a female XLR going to two phonos. That goes into the line input channels on the UI, a um, bit of mic cable in between the two, and you've got um, a 30 foot long um, two jacks to two phonos cable. Um, the bottom cables are the two Y splitters. <clears throat> I've got a bunch of these that I've made up. They're the same, they've just got black and silver XLRs, and these are what I um, uh, Y together the uh, the trumpets and the, uh, and the trombones. Um, now there was um, supposed to be um, there um, a picture of our uh, big band, but um, for some reason it's uh, it's not going to play. So I'm sorry I've overrun, but um, I'll be pleased if there's any questions. Thank you. There are questions.
Um, the first one is asking, is VCA available for monitor mixes? And when the VCA is moved, decreased or increased, will the channels added in VCA also be, or will the channels added in VCA be applied to main only, or will it apply to the monitor mixes also? Um, it depends how you've got the, um, um, the auxiliary set up. Um, the default um, is for uh, monitor mixes to be uh, pre-fade. Obviously, there are very few instances where you'd want um, post-fade monitor mixes. Uh, <clears throat> so um, the uh, VCA um, would also um, turn down um, let's see now. Um, now, if it's set to prefade, no, the VCAs are, probably won't. I'd, I'd need to check that. It's not something that I've ever ever come across, but I believe the uh, the VCAs wouldn't um, alter the uh, the level in the monitors. Okay. The next question is asking: Is negative twelve dB FS a nice setting game level in general? Um, Yes, it is. That's um, that's pretty much exactly what I um, uh, set my gains to when I'm sound checking. Um, as an experiment, as I was um, uh, preparing for this, I put some tone up into uh, a channel on my UI and just wound up the gain um, just to see when it started to clip. And um, it clips exactly when the uh, when the clip light comes on. So. If you've got something that doesn't have a great deal of dynamic range, then you can run that channel a bit hotter. But um, you know, with something like a kick drum um, or you know an instrument that's played by um, somebody that's going to get excited, um, I you know neg 12 um, or uh, or lower is uh, is a sensible level to set. Okay, next question. Um, how would you send effects to a monitor and not have a large amount of feedback? Um, it's uh, within the, let me see if I can uh, just go to my uh, UI again. I'll just put up the, uh, um, the other um, interface. Uh, I just reload in this. Oh, it's become uh, I'm sluggish. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Right, so um, in my um, auxiliary uh, sends, sorry, uh, sends um, I just got no as well. Right. So this is um, uh, the sends on uh, faders, and um, so at the moment I'm looking at uh, what's been sent to the uh, Terry wedge. So um, see, I you know if I want to put um, I wouldn't, but put some hi hat in Terry's wedge. If I wanted uh, reverb, um, then I could increase the uh, reverb return. So <clears throat> I've got um, Four um, effects engines built into the um, uh, into the UI. I just wanted reverb into the monitor. Then I would just uh, bring up that um, FX1 return, and obviously you'd uh, you keep an, an ear out for, for feedback or any nasties. And when you um, uh, go into uh, the, the um, slide out at the end, uh, mute effects, um, that would also um, mute the effects going into the um, monitor. Hope that's okay. Okay, next question. Um, can we set subgroup to matrix? Um, you set uh, yeah, matrices. Um, it, this 
it, I don't tend to use matrices. Um, I had got a matrix set, I think, by mistake in there, but um, it, it's beyond the scope of what I really wanted to cover today, to be honest, uh, Laura. Um, I, I can take that question offline and I can post screenshots of how somebody would do it, but uh, I, I don't want to waste time by getting into it right now. Okay, yeah. certainly. So to the individual that asked that, you can see that Pete's contact information is up on the screen right now. Feel free to reach out to him directly. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, we have a lot of questions still. Are you are you good, Pete? Good on time? Absolutely, yes, yeah. Oh, sorry, I'm just conscious that we've overrun. And, uh, no, no, no. Perfectly kind of fine on our end. All right. What is the software used in TouchPanel to access Mixer remotely? Um, it's um, the web. Uh, browser is that that what's meant? Um, the <clears throat> people often ask me when I'm out with the UI. They say, "Well, what app are you running on your um, your tablet or your iPad?" Um, it's not an app. It's just the web browser. Um, the UI differs from all of the other. Um, there are a few other now, um, you know, touchscreen-based mixing systems, and um, the UI um, serves a web page. Um, over its Wi-Fi hotspot and over its um, uh, its Ethernet connection. So all you need on your uh, remote device is just um, a standard web browser. On my um, Galaxy tablet, I use something called Full, ski, uh, full Screen um, Kiosk Browser, um, which is um, it allows you to use up the full screen of the um, the Galaxy tablet without any um, address bars at the top and the bottom. And on my iPad, um, I use, um, oh gosh, I've forgotten the name of it now, um, Dolphin, Dolphin Browser. And that allows you to go very easily um, into full screen, um, but you can knock it back for when you need to get to the, uh, the address bar for any reason. So um, if you were using um, um, an external touchscreen monitor and a, and a mini PC, then, you know, any browser, Chrome, or, or whatever would uh, would be perfect. All right. The next question is asking, what is the size of UI24R, and can it be installed in a rack, and how many channels does it support? Um, it's um, uh, four U in the rack, um, I believe. So my flight case was um, five U, so I had a, a one U connection panel. Um, supports um, 20 uh, mono channels and um, uh, the, the two line inputs, so uh, one pair of um, a, a stereo channel. So it's 22 all up. Okay, next question is asking, do you know what the inherent input to output latency is on the UI24R? Um, I don't, I'm afraid. Nope. Um, no, that will be in the, uh, in the details of the, um, the spec sheet. Um, that will be on um, Soundcraft's website. Okay, Scott, is that something that, that you have the answer to? It's about a millisecond. Um, it can vary depending on if you have time-based effects, obviously that will stretch out that time. But one of the nice things about having a hardware mixer uh, going through a thick set of DSP chips is we get very consistent latency and it's very short. If you're using, for example, the Digitech processing, that latency can be a little bit more. Okay, thank you very much. Um, next question is asking if it would be possible for you to repeat how to set up hardware faders on UI and which one is Unity Gain. Um, yeah. Um, right. So, uh, sorry, set up hardware faders. Um, you, the meaning um, how you set these or... Um, Quite sure of the context there. It it doesn't give context. It just says, um, can you repeat how to set up hardware faders on UI? Which one is Unity Gain? Right. Um, well, Unity Gain is um, is this little um, tick right there. Um, another one of these um, double click shortcuts. If you if you tap the double tap the uh, uh, the gain setting of the fader at the top there, um, it will pop straight up to uh, to Unity Gain. So um, you have to watch that because if you've got um, a mic that is fairly hot and you accidentally um, double-click the uh, the gain readout, then 
it's straight up to Unity. Um, that's the same for uh, uh, the main outs as well. If you double click that, uh, that used to be anyway. No, perhaps it's not anymore. Um, <laughs> it, it is for uh, a lot of the fader settings anyway. That's that's how you get to uh, Unity. All right, next question is asking, can we connect one HDMI display and one tablet at the same time? Yes, you can. Um, furthermore, um, you can sync the two together so that um, there's something in the settings called Sync ID, whereas um, if you, let's say, have a, a, a tablet sat up above your um, HDMI um, touchscreen, if you select a channel on the touchscreen, um, you can make it so that the um, the tablet will show the EQ curve or the uh, the dynamics um, settings for that particular channel. And when you change um, channel focus on your touchscreen, um, the secondary display will also change to display um, the you know the dynamics or the EQ. It's like having Big D, but instead of being on one screen, um, it's on two. You can actually have up to ten browsers all simultaneously connected. Um, to the UI, and um, you know you can sync the whole lot together so that it uh, you can have a control surface which is um, six feet wide. Okay, next question is asking: um, Can I connect my laptop directly via LAN to avoid going wireless to control the UI24 or over Cat5 cable? Yes, you can. <clears throat> you don't need um, uh, you don't need a, um, a hub or a router or a switch. Um, you can. You don't need a crossover cable either. There is something clever in um, the latest generation of um, uh, laptops, and um, you know the latest uh, Windows version. It, it sorts all of that out itself. So yes, you can. Okay. How does the AFS that is built into this unit work alongside a DVX drive rack PA2 AFS? Um, ooh. Probably they would fight each other, um, if I'm honest. Um, as I said in, in the introduction, I don't tend to have a need for um, for AFS. And uh, when I have used it, I've, I've found it it's, it's taking just too much control away from me. It's, it puts um, you know some fairly steep notches. I know when you're really um, pushing sound levels and, and pushing game before feedback, you need to make those um, those steep cuts um, in the in the spectral response, but um, uh, if you've got one device that's endeavouring to uh, counter feedback by putting notches in, and then that's feeding into another device like the drive rack with the AFS built in, um, then oh, you know it's like putting a humidifier and a dehumidifier in the same room and getting them to fight it out. I'll jump in on that one. Uh, this is Scott Wood with Soundcraft and DBX. There's in general, think of the drive rack as something that is part of the PA system, and think of your UI24 AFS as part of the mix system. If you're traveling around with a band and you and you want to control your own AFS, you can do it in the uh, UI product. If you have a PA system and other mixers are coming through your club, that's the type of situation where you'd want to have a drive rack. In general, you probably don't need both of them at the same time. I, in general, I would only use one or the other because I would want my focus of operating it on being this or that, and not having two of them run at the same time. Okay, thank you for that, Scott. Um, so we have another question here. This individual said, I had my first UI16 sent from USA as it was not available in the UK. As soon as the 24 came out, I upgraded. With the latest UI software patch, I noticed that they are cascadable. So my question is, will there be another session and will this aspect be covered? So, Scott, um, what's another session? I'd be happy to I'd be happy to talk about cascade in another session. It is uh, it, it's not terribly complex, but it does take a few minutes to discuss. Okay, thank you for that question. Um, let's see, we have another one here. Does the mixer have PEQs on all its outputs? Um, it has um, uh, graphic EQs, um, so this is the um, uh, 30 odd band graphic, um, which is across the um, you know the main the master outputs. You've got exactly the same thing across all of the 
um, auxiliary outputs that can be um, configured as matrices as well. Um, as part of this, you've also got um, uh, high pass and low pass filters. So if you're using auxiliary fed subs, for instance, then you can roll off everything, um, say, below um, uh, 100 hertz in the uh, the main A and B outputs. And you've also got the other end, um, there's uh, a uh, low pass filter. So no, it's not parametric, it's um, graphic. It looks like we have one more question. Um, how can we use an aux change in group out? An aux change? Um, I'm not completely sure what they're meaning there. It's possibly to do with um, uh, configuring a um, uh, matrix then maybe. Um, I'll happily, I'll put more meat on explanation offline if that's okay. Uh, Laura. Sure, absolutely. There's been a couple of questions about, about matrixing, so let me jump in there really quick. Thanks. So generally, generally aux outputs will take any input and allow you to, or any subgroup, and set it to an aux. Matrixes are designed for something different. You can change any aux to a matrix, but the matrixes are designed to pick up from subgroups in the master mix to make a second mix. This is common in a, like a house of worship, where you've got the main front of house mix, but you also have like a back room where the, you know, a back room or an outside room, and you want to put a sub mix of that out there. You want to have all the speaking voices, but less of the music uh, into those rooms because there's, you know, children there with more sensitive ears. So you can do matrixing on any aux out, but matrixes differ from auxes in that they only pick up from subgroups or the master mix. Okay, thank you for that, Scott. Hey, Pete, would you mind putting up your contact information one last time? Certainly, yep. Um, is that okay? Yep, perfect, thank you. So anybody who had additional questions, um, maybe reach out to Pete directly and he can go into some more detail on those questions where we needed a little bit more clarification. Um, it looks like that is all of the questions that have come in. So, Pete, thank you so much for the presentation. This is wonderful information. Um, we you. really appreciate it. Okay. Um, I'm on Facebook as well. If people want to reach out to me, I've, um, I've got permission to share some of the recordings as well. So, if anybody is after, um, you know, some multi-track stems to be able to experiment, to do their own thing with, then, uh, you know, we can um, look up offline. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. And thank you everyone for attending. Um, if you're interested in learning about any of our upcoming sessions, please visit pro.harman.com and you can see the full calendar. And we're adding, uh, I think, something like 20 new sessions to the calendar right now. So there's a lot coming up in July and August. So thanks and have a great weekend.